Iranians are trying to achieve a nuclear weapon, to have the capacity to have one. President Obama, Secretary Kerry have negotiated an agreement. The Congress is going to vote. Uh, it's going to be a big struggle for the president to, if he loses the first vote, which I think he will, to sustain, to ve sustain his veto. Um, do you support the deal? And let me ask the second part of it, too, because they, they go together. We've, and we've, you and I have been talking about this. Iran is also striking into the heart of the Sunni world in Iraq, Syria, Lebanon, Lebanon, and Yemen. It's a real problem. Is it possible to have a strategy to go forward with a nuclear deal, leading question, without a strategy to contain the Iranians? And what would that take? What would it look like? And could that possibly unite Democrats and Republicans, that second part of it, the containment of Iran long term? Well, first of all, I haven't declared on the deal. Uh, I, I will as we get closer to Congress uh, debating it. Uh, I th recognize the virtues of the deal, uh, the way it stops the plutonium path to the bomb, 90%, 95% of the uh, low enriched uranium is gone, all the 20% is gone, dramatically reduces the number of centrifuges, decent inspections regimes, there's some reservations about that, concept for snapback reservations about that. There are lots of reservations, though, beyond those, and those are captured in a, a letter by the uh, Washington Institute study group that I've been part of. Um, to the administration's credit, they have been very aggressive in engaging us. I mean, you know, when Tony Blinken calls you and asks, asks, asks questions, uh, the Under Secretary of State has reassured me that Qasem Soleimani, the Quds Force commander, will not have his sanctions by the U.S. lifted. It has nothing to do with what it says about sanctions on him because of the the uh, nuclear program. So gradually, some of this is actually being either clarified uh, or uh, resolved, although some will certainly go on into the implementation of the agreement. Beyond that, though, I think there are three critical elements that would most reassure me, and I think most reassure a lot of the other folks that are really looking at this seriously. The first is for the administration to echo very firmly what Ernie Muniz, Secretary of Energy, said uh, in, in a hearing the other day where he said that we will not allow the Iranians to have uh, wep to enrich to weapons grade uranium, period. We will stop them. That is critical. Indeed. After 10, 15 years, 10, after 15 everything. Years yeah. yeah. So in other words, when all everything is lifted, um, he, will, he said we will not allow that. That matters enormously. Nothing would be more reassuring to, the, to our ally in the Gulf states uh, than to have that echoed and re-echoed, not in a provocative, not in a poke in the eye, but just a firm statement of policy that this administration believes would be uh, carried through because, of course, it will be the successor to the successor that will be at that 15-year uh, mark. That is very important. Second, there has to be a more fully and clearly articulated comprehensive regional strategy. This is a narrow deal. It's about the nuclear program. Uh, it does not address a whole host of other issues that are of enormous concern to the countries in the region, again, to Israel and our Gulf state partners uh, in particular. And there is a sense of what Bernie said earlier that you know, we're in league with the Iranians. And I don't buy this, but again, there is this narrative that's out there. Uh, there's very tepid support after a lot of lobbying by the Gulf states themselves. And this, again, has to be a lot more than just opening, uh, you know, some of the security assistance and selling them some things that they've long wanted. Uh, it's got to be tying together uh, air defenses. It's got to be real strategy. Uh, it's got to be diplomatic uh, across the board. And uh, I think that's very, very important. And you put your finger on that. If, if you're going to have this one deal, You've got to have the, the overarching uh, contextual strategy as well. And then, frankly, related to that, I think we have to be realistic. We have to be measured in our assessment of what this might do for the U.S.-Iranian relationship. Look, I'm all for if, if Iran becomes a so-called status quo power instead of the revolutionary power that they are right now. They're not satisfied with the situation. They want to be the he hegemon in the region. Uh, they want to preserve not just the Shia crescent that runs, as, as Bernie mentioned, from Damascus, or from uh, Tehran through Baghdad, Damascus, and then down into southern Lebanon. They want to expand their control and their influence. Uh, again, would be wonderful uh, if all of a sudden the, the country were to transform and we could have a relationship with them that would be constructive. 
but I, I wouldn't plan on that. I wouldn't, I wouldn't bet on it, and I certainly wouldn't uh, make irrevocable uh, uh, strategies based on that. If it happens, fantastic. We should be ready for it. We should be ready to receive an open hand in return if it comes back this way. Uh, but again, I think we have to be measured about the, the r realism of whether that can come to pass. So hope's not a strategy. Hope is not a strategy, no. Yeah. Friend. I, I think it's funny, I, was, I wanted desperately to answer your question for or against, um, and I think I can't, because what I, what I would say to you is, I, I want to like the deal, I want to support the deal, but I share not only Dave's reservations, I'm, I am deeply skeptical about snapback on, and the inspections regime, I don't like the access to conventional weapons in five and, and missile technology in eight, I don't like any of it. Um, but what you might imagine, where you sit is where you stand. This is the single largest state sponsor of terror as we sit here. They're gonna get access when you lift sanctions to 100 or $150 billion. We are delusional if we think that's going to the people of Iran. That's gonna go, one, to line the pockets of the regime, and two, right, and two to sponsor Hezbollah, which is where, what they've been spending their money and on. The Quds Force. And the Quds Force, right. So, look, I. I don't like the deal. <laughs> um, I, I, I don't. I. I want to. I want to see when we get closer, uh, what Congress says. Look, here's the other thing. To the to the extent, and I, I like Dave, look to when people talk about what can we expect this means for the relationship with Iran. The answer is ask yourself one question. Not only are they still the single largest state sponsor of terror. They're holding three Americans. One's an American journalist. If there was any good faith, I understand, look, from a strategic and a diplomatic point of view, I understand having kept the terms of the negotiation narrow. I may disagree with it, but I understand there's an argument to be made to having done it that way. But if the Iranians were acting in good faith, when that deal got signed and John Kerry got on the plane, while he was on the plane unilaterally, they should have released the Americans they were holding as a sign of their good faith. And I think that's about, I think that's about all you need to know to know the Iranians' approach to this. All right, I, I think that the best thing about this deal is that American diplomats and Iranian diplomats have you know, now sat together for, for many, many months and we've gotten the measure of them, they've gotten the measure of us. I, the, the specifics of the deal are not, to, me, to my mind, convincing. I have to tell you something ab about Iran, and we have to be very clear-eyed and unsentimental when we talk about countries in this region. Iran is a caliphate, first and foremost. Its political system is exactly like that of ISIS, okay, in that the leader of Iran, the supreme leader of Iran, is a caliph. He does not speak just for Iran, he speaks for all Muslims. And if you believe in the doctrine of the guardianship of the jurist, which is the core doctrine of the, Iranian Islamic, of the Islamic Republic of Iran, that doctrine requires blind obedience to that supreme leader. If you don't obey him, you're sinning. Okay, so there's a theology here that many of us don't realize is, uh, you know, is fundamental to the nature of this regime. The other thing about this, about this regime is that it has f deliberately, from the very beginning, flaunted international law, uh, you know, taken our hostages, used non-state actors and proxies um, by, by design. Why do they spend billions of dollars in Syria? What is Syria to them? You know, one should ask th that question. Uh, the other thing about, about the regime that, that I think you know, should, should be very important and understood is that when you listen to what they say, so how are we described? Aside from you know, death to America and all the rest of it, which is you know, perhaps just verbiage, they describe us as the, the source or the central force of arrogance in the world. They use the term arrogance to refer to us. This is a Quranic term. This is a, a term from the Quran. It's the way Pharaoh is described in the Quran. Pharaoh for Muslims was an unbeliever, a pagan. There is no way you can make a deal with, with Pharaoh if you're a Muslim, okay? Because you're dealing with an unbelieving system, an unbelieving person, and, and ultimately the believer must destroy the, um, the, the pagan. So the language, the theology that's, that in which he speaks to his own people 
ultimately treats us not just with contempt, I mean, it's beyond contempt. Uh, so I think we should be you know, very clear ab about the nature of this regime, and especially not just how it uses its language, but its non-state actors. Finally, they have killed more Americans than Al-Qaeda has in numbers. If you count Lockerbie, if you count the troops we, who were killed in Iraq, in Lebanon. So, I mean, you know, this is really a, a place that, the way I would deal with this, this, uh, this deal is that I would tie their, their actions in the region to the deal. In other words, if you, send, if you send weapons to Yemen to support your proxies or to Lebanon, we would sink that ship and we would tie it to the deal. So, um, so the, and this is the comprehensive piece that I'm talking about. So you go back and look again, look at Iraq, look at Syria, look at what we're doing because in every one of these cases, look at Yemen, uh, in every one of these cases, Iran is engaged, and in many cases, uh, they're engaged in a nefarious manner. So um, the panel is not warm to the deal. Um, <laughs> we might, I'm we in might a, get closer to it. In a mercifully brief fashion, I'm going to take the prerogative of the chair and say I support it. And the reason... The reason is I support it is I detest the Iranian regime and everything they've done to our country for the last 35 years. I'm also mindful that there are enormous risks with this deal. But there are some benefits, and here are the primary benefits. They have been on a roll for 10 years. Ahmadinejad took office 10 years ago this month, August 5th, I believe, 2005. They've gone from a small nuclear program to a massive program. They've gone from being years away to two to three months away from a nuclear weapon. What this deal will do is arrest that forward movement, freeze it, rolls it, rolls it back. freeze it, yeah. you're anticipating my next, okay. freeze it for I'm 10 to 15, you thank you, General, <laughs> freeze it man. for 10 to 15 years, and instead of being two to three months away from a bomb, they'll be a year away from a bomb. These are unqualified benefits for us, and I am a hawk on Iran. I think this deal only makes sense if we establish a containment regime and push them back in Syria, Iraq, Yemen, places like that. I'd much rather try to contend with a non-nuclear armed Iran over the next 10 to 15 years than an Iran would certainly be a nuclear power without this deal. Last point. Um, the critics, and I've testified four times in the last three weeks for my sins on this issue, I don't hear a logical, practical alternative to the president's policy. And until we hear it, I think it makes sense to go forward with the deal.